Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. It's Thursday, April 11th today. And today I'm doing a talk on the sun's uh, square to Pluto, which is taking place right now. Um, this is a transit that um, I had marked out at the beginning of the month as potentially one of the most interesting transits of the month because it's happening as so many other things are happening simultaneously. Um, so, for example, if we look at the astrology uh, right now, I'll just give you a little survey for of, of what's going on because there's actually so much happening, and um, and I want to sort of offer some context before focusing on the Sun and Pluto today. And one of the main things I want to focus on with the Sun and Pluto is the discovery of this black hole, not the discovery of the black hole, but the image of the black hole. I don't know if you've seen this around, but it's it's pretty fascinating. So uh, at any rate, um, one of the reasons that I had this uh, transit circled for the month is due to everything else that's happening simultaneously. So check this out. We're going into first quarter moon. So that's always a pivotal time of the monthly, uh, the monthly lunar cycle. Jupiter is stationing and turning retrograde. Uh, we have a, um, a square, excuse me, from Mercury to to Jupiter. Venus is in a conjunction with Neptune and heading into a square with Jupiter very much simultaneously. While the Sun is squaring Saturn, the South Node, and Pluto. So that's an enormous lineup, right? All sandwiched between like the 9th of April and like the 15th. So it's a, it's a very, it's a sort of packed um, period of time in the month. And um, but I was really interested in, because Sun-Pluto dynamics are always very powerful. You know, for years now, anytime that the Sun is going through the cardinal signs, the tropical signs, um, there are these very, you know, pronounced Plutonian events, often, um, you know, very, very predictable themes that come along with them, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this one is this one's been kind of unique because we've had a couple of events that have happened that are in, you know mundane events happening in in the world in the collective so to speak where everyone can see and they're they really illustrate the sun pluto dynamics so let's talk about what those are the the two main events that I want to focus on today which you could list you could find others for sure <clears throat> but the two that I found very um representative of the Pluto Sun square that's perfecting right now is the um, image that was released, the first ever image of a black hole. It seems, you know, pretty remarkable when you, when you look at it, you're like, wow, this is, this is it's really incredible to be, to be looking at something you're not really supposed to see, um, which of course is a very Sun Pluto kind of dynamic. The Sun is of course light, and Pluto is, of course, dark and subterranean. So something being illuminated from below or something being illuminated that's dark or shadowy, something from the unconscious being lit up. So it has this kind of, you know, sun, very obvious sun-Pluto feeling like, oh, there's a black hole. Here's an image of it for the first time. Sun square Pluto makes some kind of sense, right? Um, the other event that's very interesting is, of course, uh, the news, I think it was yesterday or today maybe even, that uh, Julian Assange, who is the... Um, founder of WikiLeaks was arrested and I guess will probably be extradited to the United States. And I'm not going to get into politics today, so don't worry. <clears throat> but that's also a very uh, Sun Pluto like event. So I want to try to <laughs> want to try to talk about the connection between all of these things between black holes and Sun Pluto dynamics and you know Julian Assange being arrested and what all of these things have in common from the standpoint, the archetypal standpoint of the planets, what there is for us to learn. I've got a lot spread out here. I've got one, two, three, three or four texts from things that I want to read and uh, offer you some food for thought. Let's start with the most obvious. This is not just any sun square Pluto dynamic. One of the reasons that it has a little extra pop to it is due to the fact that there are also so many other transits happening simultaneously, which I've already mentioned. I'm not going to go into each of them individually. Um, but the, the reason that this one stands out is because uh, it, the sun is square to the south node of the moon, which is with Pluto and Saturn in Capricorn. 
So when you're uh, when you're at the kind the, the square that the sun is at with the south node, it's at a sensitive point that's sometimes referred to as uh, uh, the bending. Uh, the bending place where uh, planets are square to the nodes either um, uh, within 90 degrees or 270 degrees from the uh, north node. And when they're at this place, um, the, the general meaning is that the planet uh, square to the south node from the, uh, the, the from 90 degrees away from the north node, try not to be too technical here, uh, which is where the sun is at in Aries right now, will um, bring about more south node significations. It has a really heavy south node kind of feeling. So the south node, of course, is uh, was kind of enigmatically spoken of as a place where both the good and the bad would decrease. So it's a place of decrease. It's a general kind of Saturnine place. It's related to things like detachment and decline, decay, loss, death, but also the wisdom that comes from re having been removed somewhat from the world or having experienced loss or suffering or grief. So there is this uh, sense of objectivity and distance that the South Node also implies. The South Node can limit or reduce things, which is not always a bad thing. You know, sometimes you're when you're trying to downsize, um, the south node could be good. For example, if a, a boxer who was trying to, uh, you know, uh, trim down to a certain weight class for a fight um, had the south node, you know, moving over a, a Mars or something with the south node in a horary chart, and they said, will I be able to trim down in time for the fight? It would look good because the south node can limit, reduce, or indicate some kind of decline or loss. So it's not always a bad thing. Um, and again, there's a certain sense of objectivity, distance, wisdom, understanding that's associated with it, as well as uh, Saturn, Saturnine South Node is a, a place of karmic justice. The South Node is where things, they ha you know, have a way of um, the consequences of actions that we've taken um, in the past. Uh, they have a way of manifesting around the South Node. and um, Sometimes there's a sense of karmic justice or, you know, meeting with the hard, the hard Saturnine consequences of our actions in the world. So because the, the sun is in Aries right now, squaring not only Pluto and Saturn, but also is at the south bending the, that is, is contacting the south node in a very powerful way, we have this uh, extra heavy, deep kind of theme, um, which is both present in the kind of a theme of retribution, justice, or you know, the kind of heavy karmic consequences, for example, surrounding someone like Julian Assange being arrested. It's kind of like, oh, now you've got what's coming to you. You've been, you've been arrested after all these years of being wanted or, you know, your actions led to this, whatever. So it has this kind of feeling like that. Um, but also we have this uh, feeling of uh, understanding uh, and detached wisdom. We now know something about a black hole. There's this um, a, a moment of like a, achievement of, of wisdom, a uh, clarity of distance and perspective that the South Node often offers as well. So both of those things are sort of present right now. Um, the other thing that you can, I mean, just so generally speaking, it, it it's made more powerful because the sun is at the South Bending. Now, there's a couple of other things that are really interesting. For example, um, Sun Pluto in general can have to do with the downfall of powerful people or powerful men or very powerful sort of heated and contested encounters of will. Um, so, for example, you know, it's it's not unusual for there to be some kind of, you know, Herculean um, and uh, what do I want to say, like... Uh, a, a battle of wills and the the sun of course very heroic exalted in aries the sign of uh mars god of war so the desire to assert ourselves like really strong encounters with authority with power with muscle and strength assertion and will it's very yang like and then it squares pluto which is of course so deep and and transformative and so the the, the feeling of wanting to a kind of volcanic release of pent-up energy um 
frustration, anger. Uh, uh, and it can be very principled because Pluto and Saturn are together right now. So this kind of like, I'm angry and I, and I have principled reasons for being very angry or being very willful. Um, so we have to be very careful right now because of course, Sun square Pluto can arm us with self-righteousness. Well, that, you know, that person is corrupt or that organization is bad or this thing shouldn't have happened or whatever. There's some sense of uh, if no one, if, you know, some feeling of injustice and the need to, uh, for retribution or vengeance, or I'll be sort of vigilante, like, well, I'll be the instrument of justice if no one else is going to be. Well, I'll take care of that. Um, or uh, even just, even just complaining and sort of railing against things that shouldn't be, um, uh, limitations that you're facing or the feeling of needing to try to break through a limitation with pure strength or, or force. Those are all things to be careful of right now or in the next day or two. It, it's the kind of day where I'm very careful not to speed on my way to the grocery store. You know what I mean? Because it's that feeling where people are real testy around boundaries. Like, oh, that guy thinks he's going to he's going to speed and you know, whatever. I don't like his look. I'm going to, I'm going to pull him over and give him an expensive ticket. Or it's the kind where I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to take the, I don't care about the law. I need to get to the grocery store. I'm too, you know, I'm above the law. So it to be really careful about the is issues around boundaries, authority, and wanting to um, assert ourselves uh, in some way in uh, opposition with boundaries or authority. Uh, or in an oppositional relationship, of course, or a kind of, uh, in this case, it's they're one of the, I'm using the word oppositional, it's a square, the aspect is a square, but it's Mars-like, right? So it, Mars is oppositional by nature, so it's conflict-oriented. So we do have to be careful of all of that, and you can see things exposed. This is the other thing that's kind of neat about a Sun-Pluto uh, transit, is that, um, or that where Pluto represents those things that are unconscious, that uh, live below where we are aware of or where we can see the dream world, the, the things that we do, you know, unconsciously, we're not really thinking about it. And there's a whole like psychic dimension of our lives that a lot of the times we're just not in touch with. We're living as though in a dream. And sometimes our dreams show this to us in interesting ways. And sometimes dreams can become more real and lucid than our waking life because we're not really living our waking life. So dreams can speak very powerfully during Sun-Pluto transits. The Sun is related to Apollo, which is the a god related to oracles and divination, the interpretation of omens and dreams. And so, you know, just things that will pop up from the underworld and speak, whether it's in a dream or whether it's something you see, a, a sign of some kind that comes through a walk in the woods or <clears throat> taking your dog for a walk and something like that. Um, and it can, it can show up in a, in a, a variety of ways. So something that, um, just happened, for example, in my life, it was very sun, sun Pluto, right? Um, and I won't go into too many details, but, uh, essentially there was, um, uh, a homeless person who was sort of bewildered, um, uh, and it appeared as though he was trying to just walk right into our house, <laughs> right? So, and of course, this is, you know, um, this is happening. Uh, I have a Sun-Pluto uh, opposition happening in my own birth chart right now. So it was as though he was trying to walk right into our house, right? And this was uh, African-American gentleman, must have been, you know, over 70, maybe even older. Um, and... Uh, so of course it it scared my wife and I pretty bad because you know we're just going about our business in the middle of the day and all of a sudden someone appears as though someone who might be drunk or whatever he's older he doesn't look like you know he's going to harm us but he's just like coming right into the house. So um you know I like first of all had to ask him to leave and then as he was leaving I didn't want to be uh rude and i and i also recognized right away like this is sun pluto right like this is a sun pluto dynamic like someone uh you know in the middle of the day right in the middle of the day this person that looks like they're coming from the underworld like poverty drugs alcohol mental illness something is going on to this person they're just wandering in broad daylight like right into my home 
I have the sun in cancer, right? So, but I recognized the Pluto dynamic. So I was like, you know, I should, maybe I should go and, and talk to this person because, you know, when we have a fear reaction, it's just totally fear. Um, then a lot of the times we're not participating in the unfolding of a psychic event, right? So the psyche likes to speak to us in all different ways, the, the soul, the, the soul wants to speak to us in our human form. We forget. We, it's like, you know, we, we, we drink the beverage of forgetfulness and we can't hear the soul speaking. And so then when things intrude upon us and they, they just kind of enter our life in, in random ways, a lot of the times what we try to do is cure it, fix it, get the guy off my yard, right? Like that, that's the kind of thing. Uh, and um, almost unanimously, we see mystics in all traditions and especially diviners telling us, no, 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 don't, don't do that. When the messenger appears, um, it's, it's usually there is... Um, not just one message, not just one thing to be interpreted, but there is, uh, you're, you are being invited to relate to something that is in part an emergence of your own soul, right? So Sun-Pluto transits are like that. When things come up, we're not just to take them uh, on, you know, just react to them from the literal sort of sunny side of consciousness. So the sun, again, the sun might see Pluto wandering up my yard and be like, heroic, like you get off my yard, like this is my property, like, like that, right? That's, that's the sun's reaction to Pluto sometimes. Call the police, like all of this. Now, uh, that's not entirely bad. I'm not, if someone's trying to break into your house, like you might want to tell them they can't do that, right? Right. Um, uh, so there's this other side of the relationship where it's also um, trying to bring illumination or clarity to something that is dark and maybe trying to overtake you. For example, if a dream speaks to you and gives you an image of dying of cancer, it may be a really uh, a, a kick in the butt to stop smoking, right? So sometimes there is a, a clarifying of the, the intrusion from the psyche and the, the clarification interprets and gives a message or an instruction or something that you can do. Um, so there's a, this interesting back and forth between the sun and Pluto. So I went out onto the yard and I just talked to him. I was just like, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, you seemed like you were just trying to come right into my house. Like, what are you, are you okay? Is everything? And he was very bewildered. Uh, uh, and I used to be a social worker. So this was, you know, not like something I'd never seen before. I, I used to work with schizophrenic adults in Manhattan and so, uh, you know, it was, it was like sort of familiar territory to me. And I kind of like went back into my social worker uh, framework for uh, a minute and just like, you know, made sure he was all right. And then um, uh, my wife, who had been, you know, very freaked out because, you know, the kids were all, I mean, was, everything was there. And you just look and out the glass door and there's a guy coming right up and grabbing the door and starting to open it. <laughs> it's like, okay. So... She had been really freaked out and she had called the police and I had just gone and confronted him. She had ran upstairs with the kids and like called the police because she didn't, she was freaked out. I don't blame her. It was, you know, it scared me too. Uh, and the guy just looked like intoxicated or maybe high or, or e mentally ill maybe. And so um, at any rate, the police came and when they came, they all knew him by name. They were, they were all just, they all totally knew him. They, they just knew him by first name and, you know, and, it was so interesting for me to see how he changed, how his consciousness changed when the people that, the, the police that showed up and knew him started talking to him in a friendly, like neighborly manner, like, hey, Joe, how you doing? Like, what, what's going on, man? What, you know, what are you, what are you doing here? Because this is someone that they're familiar with. And so through that process, like, I got to know him a little bit. And um, that felt really good. It felt, it, felt, it felt really nice for me to get to know this man who actually uh, is, I don't know what the appropriate term is. I think it used to be called squatting, but it's, he's in and he, there's, there's a home that was abandoned across, uh, across town a ways from us. He's sort of a neighbor and he's just been living there. Um, and uh, and he, he said, what he said was that he was coming by to see if we had any scrap metal that he could take in and try to get money from. And so uh, he seemed to me like pretty harmless after all was said and done. 
But of course, the opportunity provided me with um, it, it, the the experience provided me with an opportunity to visit different kinds of fears and different kinds of assumptions and different kinds of built-in prejudices that I don't always know that I have. I think, well, I don't have any kinds of prejudices, like I'm a nice person or whatever, or I don't make assumptions about people. I don't judge people. I don't judge a book by its cover, right? So, and at the same time, the experience was also about um, not being so naive, right? There's a Sun-Pluto dynamic that's also don't just be like the heroic ego that has no awareness of the underworld that you, you, you're not naive any longer. And there's, there, you know, there's uh, a sense in which um, this differentiation between child and adult was happening. You know, the kids were taken up into a room, the adult had to go to the front door. And in doing all of that, I also just, it was a moment of feeling less um, in a little world that's private and <clears throat> nobody else has access to like my own little, you know, it's like a little Cancerian, like whatever. So it was a really, that was a very Sun Pluto like experience, right? If you can, if you can follow what I'm doing with this. All right. So Sun Pluto can be about illuminating things from the unconscious. Sometimes things that intrude very in, or that, that come in very powerfully or that are sort of released from the unconscious uh, in, in powerful ways and assail or assault the ego, make it less naive, make it less proud, you know, take it down a few notches. Or there's also the heroic need to rise up, become more mature and meet the substance of your own psyche or soul or the depths of the underworld. And both are happening simultaneously. <clears throat> now, one of the ways that I would caution us, right, as a just as a culture or a collective right now has to do with the same kind of interaction. For example, it's very, it's very important when things come surging up from the unconscious or in, in the collective that we not just take one side or the other of the uh, aspect. You know, we don't just take a Pluto dominant theme we don't just take a solar dominant theme and they can happen in different ways subtly. You know, for example, you could say that Julian Assange being arrested, ah, he got what was coming to him, right? He got, that's, that guy got what was coming to him. Justice has been served, right? But um, this is not a, an, a fully appropriate way to understand what's happened, whether you like him or not. I don't, that's not my point. Um, if we only look at it in terms of like, ah, uh, yes, the criminal, the underworld has been brought up into the light of day. That would be like me looking at the homeless guy wandering um, in toward, toward my front door into my house potentially and being like, get off my lawn. Oh, good, he's gone. Like I'm, the, you know, good thing I rid myself of that dark uh, presence. You know what I mean? Think, th think about that a little bit. Think, think about the implications of that attitude. The same thing is true for whether it's Trump or Assange or any guy or figure in the world sort of... Uh, solar figure and um, that or, or plutonian figure that we think we should rid ourselves of heroically like just get that guy out of office yeah just d send him to jail right the reason that it, we our impulse for justice is not a bad thing right i'm not suggesting that it is but the reason we have to be so careful about this is because um, we have to be we have to understand that these things coming up are a part of the collective soul. Let's remember what Hermes tells us about astrology. <clears throat> he tells us in the incarnation of the soul chapter, which I've been working through in the series I've been doing on the Hermetica, he says, <clears throat> let me see if I can make sure I find this. Ah, oh, here it is. All souls are part of one soul, which is the soul of the cosmos. All souls are part of one soul, which is the soul of the cosmos. So when we think about ancient astrology and we think about uh, these planetary configurations and things that we see happening in the collective, these are things that for thousands of years have been thought of, not just in terms of, well, that guy's karma came up, I guess it was due, 
you know, and we can sit back and feel really heroic about it or, you know, like the, the light triumphed over the darkness. But no, it's also an emergence, something coming up from the collective soul. And so when we see that, we have to also recognize what is this speaking to us? Like, what is this saying to us? Why do we need to see this figure on display? And not just this figure, but the entire parade surrounding it. The self-righteousness, the get off my lawn, the, the thank God you're going to jail, thank God the evil is being banished. If we understand this person, not to be just some wandering deviant who has no place in our world, but is actually a fundamentally uh, a, a part of our own soul, that is a part of our neighborhood, then um, our encounter with that individual, our encounter with these events takes on a different kind of quality. So, for example, um, it's important to remember some of the ways in which the story about Julian Assange has unfolded. In the beginning, Julian Assange was seen by many people in, in mainstream, mainstream media, mainstream culture as heroic for holding governments accountable. This is just a general, I'm not a big scholar of WikiLeaks. I don't want to get into any kind of debate about him or WikiLeaks. I'm just trying to give a, a general story for the, for the sake of a larger purpose here. He was considered a hero for holding governments accountable, for exposing, like a good Sun Pluto dynamic, for exposing hidden corruption, right? So that's very Sun Pluto. And everyone celebrated him as a hero. Oh, good. He's, he's taking out the bad guys. He's bringing up the stuff that nobody wants to look at, right? Sun Pluto. He's, he's sort of lifted up as a hero. But then in time, uh, in time, the narrative changes. Whether it's true or not, I'm just reporting the narrative. Then over time, it's uh, now I'm working with authoritarian governments and only going after the West. And that's the, that's the narrative that's been told. And now a lot of mainstream, same mainstream culture doesn't like him. They Now they see him as someone who's essentially just trying to take down the West. It has been co-opted by Russia and so on and so forth. So now he turns from hero to villain. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the general arc that his story has taken. So now he's being brought to justice for, you know, first his exposure that he was exposing, holding corrupt things accountable. He was sort of a Plutonian, a, a solar Plutonian agent, a solar Pluto hero. Now he's a solar Pluto villain. Do you see what I mean? And the, 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 so the, the switch for us um, happens very, can, can happen very quickly right it's so and but a, a lot of it has to do with it, how willing we are or not to consider people not just in terms of uh one kind of character or personality or um you know e expression of uh, archetypal qualities or the other but seeing people and things and events is very complex as multivalent so when we see the full story of Julian Assange, we get a much richer understanding of a Sun Pluto dynamic, for example. And when we when we do that, I'm not saying I'm not suggesting what conclusion we should arrive at. I'm just saying it's it's a lot like the initial uh, assumption. Oh, this guy's bad. Get him away from my lawn. But wait, 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 wait. Let me go talk to this person and find out. Oh, they're my neighbor, right? So that kind of duality of 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 you know is also present in the Assange story right now. And I think it's good to just be aware of that to, to, because to Sun Pluto invites us to be more deeply reflective about, um, about things that are coming up from the underworld. Um, why we, uh, why we villainize people or, or why, what it is about villains that um, we want to get them out of our picture as quickly as possible when sometimes going a little closer toward the darkness will illuminate something very important for us. And um, that differentiates things a little bit more. Like for example, what's the result of me talking to this guy and getting to know that he's my neighbor um, and uh, not just some evil villain that I need to get off my lawn. The, um, the result of that experience is that I have differentiation in my life. 
it's not just me in a cloistered little uh, lot that I live on. I have a more clear sense of the boundaries between me and other people around me. I have a more full sense of my neighborhood, of my neighbors, of the place in which I live. So the when we explore our repulsions and our immediate reactions to things, especially things that polarize us in terms of light and dark, uh, we are doing the work of actually creating a richer substratum of our life. We're 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 learning how to see the the complexities and beauty and diversity of the world and neighborhood in which we live. But that takes patience. It can't just be some kind of instant heroic reactionary trip that we that we take. I hope this is making sense. So <clears throat> so uh, this um, this of course is also. I'm not trying to suggest that there aren't real villains, right? I'm not trying to give some kind of rose-colored glasses view, uh, right? I mean, um, this guy very well, he was very bewildered. And it, I mean, I think he was going to walk right into our house. So um, the, my feeling is that there, the, the main thing is to go beyond simple to overly simple binaries, everyone's a friend. No, 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 no. Sometimes, you know, there are villains. Everything is good. Everything is safe. No, sometimes there's danger. Oh, that guy is purely a villain. Well, you liked him at the start of his story. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's that kind of complexifying of the light and dark with Sun Square Pluto that needs to happen. So if, if that makes sense, you can see this, you know, surge into your life though, right now in, in very interesting ways. It's very common, for example, to see people um, uh, uh, right now, like, again, um, polarizing. That's evil. This is good. That's just. This is unjust. And, and in some ways, trying to prop our sense of uh, power or righteousness or strength or, or dignity or, or importance up because we can point out something that we think is bad or wrong where we can take satisfaction or pleasure in having conquered or beat something or risen above something. Uh, or we can try to take justice into our own hands or, you know what I mean? So we, these are things to be mindful of. Now, um, let's talk about the black hole. I really wanted to spend some time talking about the black hole today. I think this is really fascinating. So a black hole appears. And um, I, I want to be... I'm always again just to try to push this process of of um, differentiating. What I've seen so far, for the most part, has been sort of heroic celebrating, meaning, oh, we just took something dark and unknowable like a black hole and made it known. Isn't that great? Look at how advanced we are. Isn't this magnificent? What a discovery! How much more do we now comprehend or know about the universe? Isn't this exciting, right? So it's, it, there's, I've, what I've noticed in general um, has been the celebrating of taking something dark and making it light. And to me, when I see that, I just go, hmm. But what about the idea that, um, what about understanding the dark for what it is? What, what, um, is there anything, in other words, that in, in, if we become reflective about the emerging of a, of a photo of a black hole, outside of the narrative about how great it is to have illuminated something that was dark, um, is there something else that's coming forth to speak to us? Can we let the black hole be a black hole? What, you know, can we still allow for some void to be there? Do you, do you know what I mean? So I want to talk about that for a minute by reading a couple of passages. This is from a, one of my favorite texts by James Hillman called Dream, The Dream and the Underworld. I would highly recommend reading this book um, for anyone who likes astrology and who is into dreams and omens and symbols and myth and metaphor and stuff like that. It, he was a sort of prodigy student of Carl Jung, um, but he has his, his, own, his own personality for sure. So I'm going to read a, a couple of different passages that speak to uh, the archetypal dynamics of Sun Pluto that I've been talking about, and specifically the issue of the black hole. 
<clears throat> this is on a, a little chapter called Images and Shadows. He says, entering the underworld, we're talking about Pluto, refers to a transition from the material to psychical point of view. Three dimensions become two as the perspective of nature, flesh, and matter fall away leaving an existence of immaterial, mirror-like images, Adola. We are in the land of soul. As Nielsen says, Adolon signifies simply image and always keeps this sense. For the Greeks, the soul was an image. We have to be careful about the words we use for describing these Adola. They are not substantial. And so we may not use our convenient substantializing language. We may not just say they are this or that, or say that existence in the underworld is so and so. We may speak of Adola only as they seem, appear to be, or what they liken unto. Our statements must be prefixed by an as, as if that little word is the coin we offer Charon for taking us across the separating waters between two kinds of speech. The dead speak differently. They whisper. Their talk has lost its positive substance, its natural certainty. We must lean in close to hear this kind of speech. A dola may be distinguished from icons, which are better compared with pictorial copies, visible things out there that we can touch even make. The word Adelon relates with Hades himself, Adonis, and with the word Eidos, ideational forms and shapes, the ideas that form and shape life, but are so buried in it that we only see them when pulled out in abstractions. So we are speaking of images that are at the same time invisible. We are inside the imaginative mind. Another way of putting this underworld would be to stress the shadowy or shade aspect. Skia was another word the Greek imagination used for underworld figures. The persons there are shades. So we must imagine a world without light in which shadows move. Yet, how can we speak about shadows in the dark? Since for upper world consciousness, shadows result only from physical things blocking the light. How can there be shadows in the dark? The problem is very much like trying to sense the movement of one's own shadow. Trying to catch a glimmer of the shape behind the scenes to tune into what else is going on in what seems to be a natural action or simple, simple conversation is precisely, quote, trying to see shadows in the dark. It is to notice the fantasy in the moment to witness the psyche's shadow play in our unconscious daily living. Consciousness of this sort is reflective, watching not just the physical reality in front of the eyeballs and by means of them, but seeing into the flickering patterns within that physical reality and within the eyes themselves. It is a perception of perception, or as Jung said about images, they are the self-perception of instinct. Our blind instinctual life may be self-reflected by means of imagining, not after or before events in the closet of introspection, but as an eye or ear that catches the image of the event while it occurs. So like I was saying, guys leaving my front lawn and something in me, not visually, not materially, not literally, sees the Sun-Pluto dynamic in my own birth chart and starting to form in the sky. And I see this encounter as more than what it appears to be. That's what he's talking about in terms of that space that's happening somewhere behind the eyes. That's not a literal kind of sight. That's the realm of the underworld. That's the Plutonian realm. That's the realm of psyche. That's the realm of soul. And when we develop an ability to see in that way, we are learning to see in the dark. That's a Sun-Pluto dynamic. So again, entering the underworld is like entering the mode of reflection, mirroring, which suggests that we may enter the underworld by means of reflection, by reflective means, pausing, pondering, change of pace, voice or glance, dropping levels, 
such reflection is less willed and directed. It is less determinedly introspective, like a heroic descent into the underworld to see what's going on. See, this is the problem with the black hole thing. We've found the black hole. We've got a picture of it. We've comprehended it. Now we know it. We're using the visual, we're using the visible eyes to try and enter into what science has told us is fundamentally like Pluto, is an underworld space where to understand a black hole is different than to see the perimeter of it by means of light that surrounds it. This would be like using the eyes to try to see Pluto, to try to see Hades. So there's a problem with this. I'm not saying I don't like seeing the image of a black hole. I think it's really cool. But he finishes by saying, let us rather imagine it to be more hermetic. A cocked ear, huh? A sideways look, ah. A suspicious fish eye. Wait a second. What is this guy really doing on my lawn? What's really going on? Sun Pluto, right? An intuitional feeling or thought that appears in the midst of life and twists life into psyche, into soul. Now, the other thing that I saw going on with this black hole <clears throat> is a lot of people interpreting it as a cervix, which I don't have any problem looking into the clouds and finding images. I am a big believer that you know, nature speaks and presents all sorts of images to us. And I was compelled by that description of, a, of a, the black hole looking like a cervix. But this is also <laughs> problematic. And I'm going to try to explain why. No offense to women. Here's what he says. Hillman says on a section where he's differentiating underground and underworld. And this is, again, in relation to Pluto. <clears throat> When using the word, word underworld, so when referring to Pluto, it is imperative to keep in mind a distinction made by some classicists. This distinction is of great psychological importance because it frees the psychic realm from nature. Cathan and Gay, underworld and underground, do not necessarily refer to the same region or evoke identical feelings. Cathan is in Cathanic with its derivatives, refers in origin to the cold, dead depths and has nothing to do with fertility or the feminine. This kind of deep ground is not the same as the dark earth and the great lady who sends black-winged dreams and who can also be called Erinys, cannot simply be merged into the single figure of the great earth mother. Psychology's great mother complex has swallowed even her own differentiations. Small wonder that this complex is also called Ouroboric consciousness, for even she herself vanishes into an interpretive monotony that makes me believe that the monotheistic psychology I so often belabor is less a mimesis of ancient Hebrew monotheism then it is a mimesis of the great mother monotheism. Monism as momism. Be this as it may, when we read analytical psychology today to discover about the Chthonic, that's the Plutonian, we find it is taken on her meaning of primitive earthiness. It's a vagina, it's a cervix. The black hole is really a feminine organ. It was discovered, the algorithm was created by a woman, so it must be a cervix. When we go like this, it's, not, it's nothing at all to take down the power of a feminine achievement or to uh, say that there, you can't make interesting imagistic associations with the black hole and a cervix. What, it's, what he's trying to do is save the dignity of what the chthonic depths really represent, which goes beyond gender and sex. It's not the same. The depth and dark of Pluto is not feminine. It's not masculine. This move ignores that Chthonic is an epithet belonging also to Hermes, who is neither masculine nor feminine, Dionysus, and to Zeus. And it ignores in the sense of, is ignorant about, Chthon that cannot be identified with instinctual body or with earthy soil. Why is this so important? Again, let's read what Hermes says. He says, 
It is impossible to be permanently happy while attached to a body. A man should train his soul in this life so that when entering the other realm where he is able to see a tum, he does not lose his way. This is very important because what Hermes is telling us, the only person who can go into the realm of the soul, into Hades and come back out, is that in order to see there, and in order to recognize what is true in that realm, you need to develop a kind of sight that is not ultimately attached to the body and to nature, even though nature and the body are also extolled in the Hermetica as beautiful. But this kind of vision is not literally coming through your retina, and it's not literally related to the soil or to the, the womb or to right natural elements. He also says, all souls are part of the one soul, which is the soul of the cosmos. Souls all have one nature. They are neither male nor female. Such differences of sex arise only in the body. This is the same perspective that the chthonic depths of the underworld bring us. As Hillman was saying in Dream in the Underworld, they bring us a perspective of life that is of the soul. And the soul goes beyond the connections to nature or to man, or to woman, or to vagina, or to penis. They, it, the, the, the psyche, the, the psychic underworld represented by Pluto is not to be identified with those things. Otherwise, what happens is you're prone to taking, you're prone to taking things literally. You're prone to thinking, oh, now I know what that means. The black hole is not something that you can know. It's not something that you can comprehend. You can draw a ring of light around it to see its edges or something like that. But the actual interiority of the black hole, like psyche, like soul, like underworld, is not to be apprehended, right? It's not to be grasped. This is very important because one of the things that we do when trying to apprehend nature is also uh, there's there are some complicated things happening around the topics of vaginas and cervixes and, and penises and things like that. For example, um, let's read what one scientist said about this discovery to give you an eye into um, uh, part of the mood around this. We have seen what we thought was unseeable. We have seen and taken a picture of a black hole. This is coming from a physicist that comes from uh, Harvard. Well, first of all, just notice what's happening there. We have seen the unseeable. That's not, so no, you haven't. If, you've, if we're taking what the chthonic depths really means, then the answer is actually no, you haven't seen it. You, you, have, you have made, you have tried to interpret something. You, you, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, uh, it's the same kind of move that I started off with on my porch being like, just get out of my yard. It's the same thing, like now I have you, now I know what you are, now I've apprehended, now I've comprehended, now I've, I've, I have decided upon the matter, I've judged. That's the sun trying, in a sense, to dominate the chthonic depths. Now I know. And in that, um, there is also a grasping, um, a grasping, a, a, a trying to grasp, right? And that's the, that is the, in some ways, uh, as in in nature that you can see it sexually like the grasping of a vagina it's not always a good thing there's something lusty and grabbing about that in the attempt to grab nature and lust after it and pull something from it to extract something from it some kind of life-giving power or force there is something very seductive about trying to do that. Just as you can also say that we try to rape nature and penetrate it in order to extract something from it that we want or desire. Both the male and female reproductive organs can be used uh, in, in this archetypal dynamic in order to say we're trying to get something here. We're trying to grasp something, we're trying to penetrate something, right? So both are problematic. And this is why Hillman's so insistent upon telling us that the underworld is not to be understood in terms of nature, natural, masculine, feminine types of dynamics. We're going into the realm of the soul here. Black holes are a great, a great illustration of this point. Here's what the physicist goes on to say. <clears throat> We've been studying black holes so long, sometimes it's easy to forget that none of us have actually seen one. Right? 
that you should re I, I mean, I'm not trying to sound, you know, um, uh, too pedantic here, but that, that is one of those statements that if, if you were, if you can be in the sun Pluto mode of, of being reflective upon what's emerging from the unconscious, think about what you're saying. We have been studying something that we can't know. That's what you're saying. So where does, where does the appreciation for that inability to know come from? And, and now is, is, are you really going to let go of that just because you have an image? Do, do you see what I'm saying? In this way, science in its conclusions presents us with false idols and takes away and strips us of the ongoing process of imagination or continuing to go deeply into something. So he says, <clears throat> it's been such a buildup. It was just an astonishment and wonder to know that you've uncovered a part of the universe that was off limits to us. See how there, there's that desire to get rid of the limit. I want to know, I want to see, I want to grasp, I want to penetrate, right? And this, in this way, the, the natural, uh, literal instinct is not the right one to, to really um, move into the chthonic depths of what a black hole represents in the imagination. What, what it, the imaginal power of a black hole is not in being able to apprehend it, see it, get to it because it was off limits before. And then <clears throat> he says, um, <clears throat> It really brings home how fortunate we are at a species at this particular time with the capacity of the human mind to comprehend the universe, to have built all the science and technology to make it happen, right? So again, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a physics science nerd. I like this kind of stuff. I'm not anti-physics. I'm not anti-science. I, like I like seeing a black hole. It was pretty cool. But I have to pay attention to this as someone trained with the archetypal eye, as Hillman says. The capacity of the human mind to comprehend the universe. What does comprehend mean etymologically? What does, comp what does it mean etymologically? To, here's what it means. E etymologically, um, <clears throat> including the image of to, uh, from print prehendere, which means to catch hold of or to seize, uh, and from a further root, to seize or to take. <clears throat> to seize with the mind or to comprehend. Um, so again, to me, this is really problematic because even though I like looking at the image of a black hole, um, it, 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 we, if, if, it, if the black hole loses its ability to be a place of imaginative um, depth, like the underworld, where our knowing goes away and a different kind of knowing has to come in. Imaginative knowing, soulful knowing, contemplative knowing, right? The kind of knowing, like I said, where, I, wait, 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 why is this guy, why did this guy come here? What is really happening right now? What's going on? I'm seeing with something that's not literal anymore. I'm entering the black hole, right? That is how... We that that has to be there, right? So the desire to take that away, to comprehend, to seize it, is problematic. So I'm just I'm trying to stick up today for the black hole because on some level it feels today, even though like there's a picture of a black hole, I just feel like I've been noticing this attitude as though black holes are somehow done. <laughs> they that they're that there's a way of saying like now we know, and I don't think so. One last thing I want to read you, two, two things. The death metaphor, here's Hillman talking about death and in relation to the, think about the black hole, death, uh, Pl Pluto, the soul, the place beyond gender, sex, the place beyond natural metaphors <clears throat> and natural concretizing. When I use the word death and it brings in it <clears throat> and bring it into connection with dreams, I run the risk of being misunderstood grossly, since death to us tends to mean exclusively gross death, physical, literal death. Our emphasis upon physical death corresponds with our emphasis upon the physical body, not the subtle one, on, psych on physical life, not psychic life, on the literal and not the metaphorical. 
That love and death could be metaphorical is difficult to understand. After all, something must be real, says the ego, the great literalist, positivist, realist. We easily lose touch with the subtle kinds of death. For us, pollution and decomposition and cancer have become physical only. We concentrate our propitiations against one kind of death only, <clears throat> the kind defined by the ego's sense of reality. The death we speak of in our culture is a fantasy of the ego, and we take our dreams in the same manner. Our culture is singular for its ignorance of death. The great art and celebrations of many other cultures, ancient Egyptian, the Greeks, Tibetan, honor the underworld. We have no ancestor cult, though we are pathetically nostalgic. We keep no relics, but collect antiques. We rarely see dead human beings, <clears throat> though we watch a hundred imitations of death each week on the television tube. The animals we eat are not killed by us and are put away out of sight. We have no myths of the, <clears throat> of the uh, Nikaya, yet our popular heroes in films and music are shady underworld characters. So in this, he's, Hillman's pointing out the double standard. We're not, we are not comfortable with the, the, the depths, with um, that which is Chthonic, which is Plutonian, which is underworld. And you can see this by the fact that we have fantasy representations of darkness that allow us to keep it at bay. <clears throat> and typically, we only look at those images in terms of how they can be converted into a heroic overcoming. I, I've triumphed over the darkness. There was a, you know, there's people that die in the movies we watch all the time, but I don't want to see a dead body. That's dark. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> um, uh, Hillman's point is that our culture is actually deeply uncomfortable with the unknown and um, we'll do anything we can to try to translate something unknown into a familiar image. And that's why I'm resistant I'm resistant to the some of the stuff surrounding the black hole, interpreting it as one image or another. I don't care what kind of image. Any anything where it's being interpreted, where now we're comprehending, where it's such a proud moment of understanding. We comprehending the universe. Think of how completely, uh, completely arrogant a claim that is. We don't understand anything about the universe in the grand scheme of things. Very very little. So. We have to be very, very careful of the attempt during Sun-Pluto moments to try and take the darkness and somehow, you know, wrap it up in some kind of heroic overcoming or understanding. <clears throat> but there's one redemptive, uh, true to heroic, uh, heroic form I want to go in the opposite direction to end. There is another great book by James Hillman. I'm going to read you one quote to finish with. This is called... The Thought of the Heart and the Soul of the World. Now, um, in, this, uh, in this book, uh, Hillman talks a lot about the heart, which we can also relate to uh, the sun. And, um, and what does the heart look like, if you take, think of sun, in relation to Pluto? What kind of heart is a sun-Pluto heart? When you, when you think about the richness of heart, when you think about the goodness of heart, when you think about the, the depths and beauty of heart, how does that go along with Pluto? He says, It was Henry Corbon's gift to enable us to experience thoughts that come from another language and culture as if they were of our own hearts. He spoke from within his speech. He was he was his words. This rhetorical imaginative power is Haima, of which Corbin writes in his study of Ibn Arabi. Quote, this power of the heart is what is specifically designated by the word Haima, a word whose content is perhaps best suggested by the Greek word enthemesis, which signifies the act of meditating, conceiving, imagining, projecting, ardently desiring, in other words, of having something present in the thymos, which is vital force, soul, heart, intention, thought, desire. As he goes on to explain, this haima, the thought of the heart in Ibn Arabi, 
is so powerful as to make essential as to make essentially real a being external to the person who is in this condition of enthymesis. Listen to that one more time. The thought of the heart, when, you, when you're in your heart, when you're meditating, and you're going into that place that's beyond the literal, that's beyond the, the natural, and you're, you're going into the, the soulful place of the heart, and you're doing a, a kind of uh, meditation or contemplation, the things that emerge there and the actions that they lead to create real things in the world that were not there before. So when I had that moment, okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to be heroic here. I'm lucky that I had that moment because I could have easily missed it because of my ego. And I had that moment and I said, why is this guy on my lawn? What's really happening right now? And it was in, in, in a very intense, deep moment of contemplation in a heightened state of anxiety. A, a, a rapid beating of the heart was happening. And then I said, oh, son Pluto. And suddenly I felt compelled to go and this person was now real to me, right? And so I had an encounter with that person and they became real. They went from being a shady figure that was mostly actually a part of my imagination, my assumptions, my built-in, uh, my illusions, right? Because I went into the thought of the heart, the contemplation of what arose and the interaction that came from it led to me living in a more real world. So Haima creates as real the figures of the imagination, those beings with whom we sleep and walk and talk, the angels and daimons, who as Corbin says are outside the imagining faculty itself. Haima is that mode by which the images, which we believe we're making up, are actually presented to us as not of our making, as genuinely created, as authentic creatures. And as Corban goes on to say, without the gift of Haima, meditation of the heart, we fall into modern psychological illusions. I'm going to interpret that man's appearance from the comfiness of my house after it's happened and I've gotten him out of my lawn. No, the Haima, the, the Sun Pluto moment has the power to send us through some powerful response, um, which can happen in and through nature, but it sends us into the imaginal psychic depths of the heart and what we meet there, the images, realizations, the things that come there and the actions they propel uh, create what is actually real. The, the, the things that are actually real come out from the shadows. So we can't forget that a black hole is not something that just wants to devour everything and keep everything locked in. It's not an, an image of evil. Uh, it, it is a, uh, it, it's like a vortex through which if you enter with sincerity of heart, you learn to see what is real and what is true. That's why Hermes says, you can't find permanent happiness in the body. But if you learn to see with the heart, and then when you go into the land where your eyes can't see, you'll see God. You'll see divinity. That's happening in our world too. When a sun Pluto transit happens and we learn to see with our hearts and, and, and do that work, then what emerges is the truth, is the real stuff. It's the stuff of, of and, and, and what does it feel like? It feels angelic. It feels celestial. It feels spiritual. And it's happening right in your neighborhood. It's happening on your front lawn. So, I hope that this has been interesting for everybody today. It gives you some good things to think about. I want to send all love and respect to the, um, to the uh, woman who discovered uh, her algorithm led to the discovery of this beautiful image. I have nothing against the image. You know, I, I like to try to bring things out that are happening in the world and try to push in the direction that we may not be thinking of, that we not, may not be always comfortable with. Of course, I was born with the sun in an almost exact square to Pluto. So I, I, I was, you know, it's, it's very natural for me to think about these kinds of dynamics from a sun-Pluto perspective. And I just want to do a little advocating for black holes without any images. <laughs> so, all right. So I, I hope this stimulated something good in you. And um, as always, I appreciate uh, uh, spending time with all of you and I look forward to more soon. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have a nice week. Bye.